Okay, I was supposed to use this because apparently we're recording Rules Plus, so people want to go to school on us, no doubt. Um, on tap today, actually, some real rules, amazingly enough. But before that, I, th there's, uh, I think there are two mechanics things that are worth uh, addressing. Number one, if you're in a five-man crew, so Carter, you don't have to listen to this because, you know, you guys are not five-man. Well, that's true. Um, here's a pretty common play, and it's probably worth discussing how exactly to try to cover it. Pretty simple. You got a, a pretty long run down the sideline. Say the linesman is trailing. Um, you know, we're supposed to stick at the line of scrimmage on the wing, so of course he's not going to be stride for stride with this 17-year-old uh, kid. So he's about to score. You know, the wingman is maybe, you know, 10 yards behind him, which is pretty good. Uh, you got a back judge. The back judge is properly standing on the goal line. Uh, right at the goal line, the ball comes loose. Is it a touchdown? Is it a fumble? Is it a touchback? Yeah, some, it, it would be worth some thoughts about how you would cover that in your crew, what, what the dynamic might be. Anybody had a similar play? Ah, okay. And so you knew for a fact that he, he, he got rid of the ball before he crossed. Yeah. Okay. How uh, uh, how do you enforce it? Okay. Sound good? Yeah. What, uh, what, how, how'd the coach react? Good. Good. Wow. Okay, well, what about this play about the fumble now? Um, I can tell you what happened um, uh, on this play. The wing guy comes down. Uh, I think the back judge was unsure. If, if you look at the video on it, it's hard to tell that the ball came out. I don't, I'm not sure that um, uh, either guy knew that the ball was out. Uh, and there was also, there was, there's action going on around right in front of the runner blocks and stuff going on. And so there, there's a lot going, you know, the problem with the blocks is number one, it's a distraction probably to the back judge looking down the goal line because there's stuff going on ahead of the runner. And also uh, there are angles where you're blocked out. You, where the ball is. Apparently the ball was inside, uh, but there are players intervening. So it's, uh, I don't think it was immediately apparent even that the ball was out. So uh, I think in this case, the wing guy, uh, there's, uh, the wing guy comes down, waits till he's at the goal line as we typically would do, and uh, goes up with the touchdown. And uh, with such conviction, and uh, determination to sell the call, as we would all do, um, the back judge, I think, probably backed off because I don't think the back judge was real sure either. So any, any ideas about how you might handle that in your crew or if something like that has happened to you? You're gonna wait for the back judge regardless? You're gonna ask the wing guy to make that call? How, how much you do that? You're going to kill the clock and come together. You're going to come down to the goal line. And uh, like what, uh, what would, uh, what do you think the wing guy should signal or the back judge should signal uh, before they go ahead and get together? I mean, part of it is the optics here. Uh, that's kind of a vogue word uh, for a lot of things. But 
Uh, how also can we do that without looking like we're completely clueless? Which maybe we are, but we try not to look at, let people know that we're clueless. Just come down and kill the clock. So you're suggesting maybe go up with a touchdown signal. No, not go up with it. Okay. Okay. Um, it went out of the end zone. <laughs> Unfortunately. Yeah. Now, I don't think there's anybody here at Marvell or uh, Pete On Saturday, I'm not sure exactly what they're coached to do because they know there's going to be replay on that. And, I, Frank, and of course, Friday, we're out of luck. So I don't know what, what their approach would be. And, of course, in a seven-man crew, you're going to have a guy standing right there. So this is a uniquely five-man crew dilemma. What the hell are you supposed to do? And... Um, uh, Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and this, well, uh, anyway, I, I would leave you to ponder that. Uh, I don't think there's any correct answer here. I don't pretend to have any, uh, to be sending from the mountain with any uh, special answer on it. Um, I know uh, in our crew, I think we've talked about any time, it's almost like the replay rule, that they almost automatically look at stuff on a score and maybe that's the answer is that it, that's kind of automatically our default uh, reaction uh, when there's a, a play that's at all possibly controversial is to uh, make sure we talk uh, even briefly and then uh, make a ruling, even if it seems like it's pretty obvious. Because uh, sometimes we think it's obvious and maybe it's not. And now um, if you have radios, you might say, I, you know, I don't know if there's time to hit your radio and talk to each other. The trouble is nobody knows what you're doing, and so then maybe we really look clueless because you've got two people standing uh, many yards apart doing nothing uh, except talking to each other on the radio. So at any rate, that, that is a really tough play. It doesn't happen all that often, but that's what we're stuck with, particularly where we're asked to keep the wing guys on the line of scrimmage until the play ends up moving downfield. Okay, uh, one other thing I've got for you, and um, I'll run this by you. <clears throat> How have your, uh, particularly your, your play clock timers been? Okay. We got a real problem here in River City. Uh, we, we had, um, I hope he's not here. I don't think he is. We had the play clock operator from hell on Friday night. And fortunately, uh, we had a little help. Uh, we had Bill Steffick was up there, and we also had a radio. We have radios, and we have a sixth one, and so we'll give it to the timer. And so there were several times where we had to look, please give me 40 on the clock, not 25. It should be running. It should be stopped, whatever, whatever. Um, it turns out, and I'm going, to st I'm going to stop assuming as well, this operator had never done it before. He's, he's been around for a few years, so he's not a rookie official, but he hadn't worked the play clock before. And during, we were talking to him before the game, and he was going, yeah, right, okay, yeah, they're kind of like, yeah, I know what's going on. And I decided, well, you know what, I ought to just straight out ask, have you ever done this before? Do you have any questions? Whatever, whatever. Uh, but... I have uh, come up, I had a little free time on my hands, and let me share with you, I'll put this, um, when we put this up on RefTown, here you go, oh shoot, here we go, here, let me get there, I have made a little form, there you go, uh, let's see. 
It's like a little flow chart. I'm going to give that, you know, we have those, you know, we, we give them those, we have a cheat sheet and whatever. I'm, I'm thinking uh, if you have some ideas, uh, it'd be great to w welcome. But if you break it down, this is, these are the ways a play can end. And all you got to do is go down to the bottom row there. And if it's in green, that means you're going to set it at that time and run it. If it's in red, you're going to set it at that time and stop it. So I might suggest to you, you can rip this off, or you might want to come up with your own kind of sheet to uh, give to uh, the play clock guy. Um, there's a second page that has uh, kick plays. So, I, I mean, that covers virtually everything that could possibly happen. So, like I so said, we'll put that up on RefTown. You can look it over and see if it um, fits something that would be helpful to you. Yeah, Bill? What's it look like? What's on there? It's just eight and a half sheet of paper and it's got like bullets on the various things, little things, that just little changes, you know, little things I need them to do during the game to be aware of. My, okay, it's 40 on this, it's 25 on this, and just, just it's like bullets, like little okay. outline, headline, same bold, big bold, you know, size 14 font, print, bold letters, and just read it. Okay. Right on. But can't see us, I'd rather think read that. Yeah. This looks, looks a little smaller than it is. I thought something visual and something you could see at a glance, that might work. I, I would suggest you might want to think about coming up with something that you can give that play clock operator that would help. Now, a couple other things, and um, there probably won't be a total agreement on this. I think the first week, I remember the, uh, I, I took Marvell's advice, and when the, the play clock guy came down, I asked him, well, what do you do? And I let him tell me what it is that he's used to doing. And actually, amazingly enough, it was an AISD guy. They never come down. Um, but he did, and he told me what he was going to do. And the one, th and one of the first things he said was, well, I'll wait uh, at the end of the play. I'll wait two or three seconds, and then I'll start the clock. And we went on. And so finally, we went back and said, OK, do me one favor. Uh, don't do the two or three second thing because we're going to get late in the game and suddenly uh, that 40 second clock is going to be really important and I don't want that thing sitting up there not running for two or three seconds which is going to seem like an eternity. And the, I don't know if he was t um, told specifically to do two or three seconds. What he was probably told, because I know a lot of us do it, is well you know kind of pause just a little bit. You don't have to sit there ready just to hit that thing just the instant that a hand goes up. I mean, I think we can all appreciate that. But a lot of these guys interpret that to mean that I'm going to count one Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippi, boom, and now I'm going to go. And that's okay And with eight minutes to go in the first quarter, but if it's a one-point ball game with two minutes to go in the fourth quarter, uh, that can be a real irritant. Um, matter of fact, what was it? In last night's, uh, was it the uh, Packers game? Wasn't there like a three-second differential, I think? But, or uh, I, don't, I don't even remember which game it was at the end. Um, and, and, you know, people notice that. So um, whatever you do when you talk to that play clock guy, I, personally, I think it's just easier. Look, just do it like the rule says. Somebody puts his hand up, start the thing. You don't have to be in a hurry to do it. But, I, see, I don't even say that. I just say the hand goes up, start the clock. Because otherwise, you, you have no idea what they're going to interpret that to mean. So would it be that scenario in the play clock that you've been running? Or is that three seconds longer than the game clock that was running? Uh, no, the, I think the play ended with 43 seconds on the game clock. Correct. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, so there were three more seconds on the game clock than the play clock. Yeah. Bill, I, I think you're of a mind to have them milk that thing a little. And if that works for you, that's great. Sometimes you go to these schools and you get the people there running the clock, and suddenly it's fast for the visitors and slow for the home team. Yep. I said, you bring, give them a thousand one start all night. That's all I ask them to do. It always works. That way, they, that way they're consistent. I just want them to be consistent all night. Well, sometimes what they're consistent at is a thousand one becomes a thousand three. So there you go. So, 
Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> that's why we wear the white hats so we can uh, make the big decisions like that. But anyway, I, I thought I'd share that with you. Uh, anything else, anything that's come up? We're, we're two weeks in now. I mean, that's why we're here is to share stuff that maybe has come up. Mechanics, rules, anything uh, screwy? Yeah. What do you all do? I'll tell you what we do. As a matter of fact, we just changed it slightly. I had been looking at the back judge because he's the one bringing him the ball. And I was, had tunnel vision. And when he got over there and put his hand up, boom, I was ready to go. And we looked on video. And as we all tend to do, he tended to, he'd get to the sideline. He hadn't even turned around yet. And he was starting to put his, his hand up. And on a couple of occasions, we were probably kicking more quickly than we should have. Matter of fact, uh, a game ago, I think we had like 10 on the receiving team, and the back judge wasn't aware of that. So I've now uh, stepped back, and I'm going to wait for the umpire to mirror the back judge's ready sign before I, I bring it in. Yes? Okay. Yeah. He make it ready when he hits the numbers? Well, if it's 48 to nothing, maybe. <laughs> okay. Yeah, no, we don't want to do that. Um, uh, matter of fact, in a pretty big game last year, we had a, we had a do-over on the kickoff because we weren't ready to go, and uh, the back judge wasn't aware of that. And it, I mean, it's not a catastrophe, but it looked a little sloppy. So uh, we've, we've made that slight change. And actually, the other ones are sitting there already up. And the only one who's not up is the umpire. And he's specifically waiting until the back judge gets over there and goes up. When I see Andre go up, that's when I know we're ready to go. Now, do you, is anybody working the, uh, we work the short kickoff thing all the time. Um, have you been having the fair catch? Do you work the short? No, we don't. We did it last year. We got evaluated three times. Every evaluator told us don't do that. I bet you had, uh, was it, is it Mickey? No. Or uh, not Mickey. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah, he doesn't like that. Oh, Okay. Really, we finally had a couple this week at like the 21 yard line. See, that's the trouble there. A lot of them are pooch kicking. They're not kicking it deep. And uh, I mean, uh, I'm, I know this will stun you. I'm not all that terribly fast laterally, but on those rare occasions when there's one going by the pylon, those are pretty rare and nobody knows anyway whether it was in or out and you can sell that uh, call, but. Okay. Okay. And th and that's allowed in our mechanics now to stagger them. So yeah. <laughs> now, do you have the uh, age old? Well, I'm going to take two thirds. You're taking one third. How do you work that? Whoever's closer. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We'll wind it in. All right. Okay, well, uh, all right, the actual, the prepared program here. What's that? Um, I'm fast at getting back to the locker room. <laughs> the buffet, yeah. Thank you very much for that contribution to Rules Plus. <laughs> See, how, how am I moving, huh? How, how, 
Yeah, that's the sad thing. Well, all right. Actually, some rules uh, now. I thought it would be, uh, it's easy to download this thing. I don't know if any of you, I, I bet many of you have downloaded the rule book. And, of course, we have the ARs in the back of the rule book. But I had never taken a good look at the case book. I don't know if you're even aware that there's a case book. And, of course, it's for the replay officials. And I, I first wondered, well, we have a case book in basketball, and that makes sense because there are no ARs there. They're all in the case book. But I wonder, well, why does football have a case book? Well, it's for the uh, replay official. And I, I used to think, well, that's irrelevant to us. But I, I got to leafing through it a little bit. I downloaded it. It's free. And there's a lot in there <coughs> that in, in talking philosophy to the replay official, I think there are a lot of tips there for us uh, for guidelines for when we're making the call live on the field. So I thought it would be uh, useful to uh, uh, look at uh, some of the stuff in the case book. And I've taken some screenshots and all. And um, so if you get a copy of the uh, PowerPoint uh, from RefTown, uh, that'll be there. So, uh, we'll start off with a, a couple of questions here. Pretty easy. These are true-false, and they're based... Uh, some of these, I think, may be surprising. So, I invite you, if you care to participate... Okay, this is concerning a catch. You should rule a player has made a catch if you see him firmly gripping and controlling the ball, getting a body part down in bounds, and doing something with the ball that is common to the game. True or false? And I bet you, I figure we get it down to two options. Maybe for one of these, we'll actually get 100%. Well, I think that's still the unattainable goal with the... Okay, we've got a few, few uh, responses coming in. And I... Uh, okay, here we go. Okay, want to bet we got 100%? No, I don't either. All right, let's see. Whoa! All right. We did it. We did it. <laughs> and it's even the right answer. Uh, as you'll see in a second, there are about two or three others of these, and then I'll show you the text from the case book. Uh, all right. All right, while the ball is usually controlled by the hands and arms, pinning the ball with the legs uh, can constitute a firm grip and control. What do you think about that? I got to save that answer to number one, show it to Marvell. Yeah, yeah, that's, I'll do a little Photoshop there, and we're really going to look good. Okay, let's see what you all think here. All right, that's pretty close. So, are we 89% right on this one? We'll see in a moment. I think there are two more. A player going to the ground out of bounds must maintain control through the entire process of going to the ground. So even slight ball movement is an indicator of loss of control. Um, I, think it, I think they're referring to a catch, actually. Because if, if we're a runner, he'd already have control of the ball. The question would be whether he's losing a fumble. All right, 
we have a representative number of responses. Ah, a little bit more of a split here. Okay, ooh, neck and neck. Well, we, we're sure gonna get consistent uh, calls on this play, aren't we? <laughs> okay, one more, and then we'll look at the, uh, what the casebook actually says. All right, you must rule no catch if the ball comes loose when it hits the turf before any other body part hits the ground. Is this another 100 percenter? What do you think? Okay, oh, we got 19 responses here. People are jumping on this one. There we go. All right. Except for that third one, we've got pretty much a very large majority uh, responses uh, to all of these. Um, I can tell you that one of these is wrong, that the group response is wrong at least according to the case book. Okay, there's uh, the text from uh, the case book. Here we go. Read this one, this one may surprise you. I don't know if you can read it. A player going to the ground must maintain control through the entire process it is important to realize that slight movement does not constitute loss of control. Some loss of control indicators are a hand or hands coming off the ball, a bobble, the ball touching the ground, or the ball moving up and down the receiver's body. How about that? So uh, I don't know what the difference between slight movement and a bobble uh, I don't know what the difference between that is, but I guess our omniscient replay officials can tell. Um, but that, that actually surprised me a little bit. And, that, and actually, that kind of meets common sense. A lot of these replays, you see them, and yeah, when you super slow-mo, there's a little bit of jiggle in there, and you think, oh, man. Um, but that's not, you know, but we all know a football play when we see it, and yet when you slow it down, it seems counterintuitive sometimes. So... Uh, if you remember, I think that was the second item. Uh, let's see. Um, yeah, so even slight movement is an indicator of loss of control, and that actually is false. This previous one, uh, also, it does specifically say that pinning the ball with the legs does not constitute possessing the ball. Uh, there's also another spot in that case book that talks about uh, for a fumble recovery. If it's uh, between a guy's legs or whatever, he, he does not possess it. Um, interesting uh, point there. Okay. Firm grip and control. Uh, Yeah, here's number two. A ball can be controlled only with the hands and arms. A player pinning a ball with his legs does not represent firm grip and control. So there you have it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I mean, have you ever seen that? I, I mean, I. When you think about it, you're in that pileup, and you, nobody really has it. And uh, I'll tell you, I, I can go way back and give you one scenario that we had uh, many, many years ago. And I'll, I'll tell this, it, this story on Arnold Gladson. I was on the wing. It was uh, Arnold uh, Chuck Hickey. Some of you may remember that name. That shows you how long ago it was. Anyway, this is at Quero. This, is, this was the first year that the extra point was live. 
Cuero was playing, I should remember who it was. Um, I don't remember who it was, but Cuero was a pretty big deal. They're behind the whole game. They score. Uh, they are down a point, so they're kicking the extra point. It's blocked. Uh, everybody starts celebrating because, again, we, we forget that the, uh, the, the rule was just in that year. Well, it turns out the ball is blocked. There's a guy laying on the ground from, the, uh, from Team A, and the ball actually was between his legs, pinned between his legs. Um, a member of the, I'll, I'll take that back. It was, uh, Quero had been scored on. Quero had been scored on. A guy from the uh, team that just scored picks the ball up from between this guy's legs and takes it in and take, gets the two-point conversion. They beat Quero by a point. And the only question was, uh, I've never seen a video of it. Back then it would have been film, was whether the guy was down on his knee when he picked the ball up. But it was between the guy's legs. And to his credit, Arnold did not blow the play dead. None of us blew the play dead. Uh, and Arnold certainly did not. At any rate, they go in. They thought they won the game because they blocked the kick, and it turns out, sorry, uh, you lose. The new rule nailed you. So that's the only time I've seen that play. Every, uh, so uh, that caught my attention as well when we saw it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, did you? Did you? What did you get? Um, what was the feedback? Oh, thank God. After all these years, I can tell Arnold. <laughs> I say the only question was, and, and I, to this day I couldn't tell you for sure, was whether the guy that picked the ball up was on a knee when he, when he actually possessed it. Um, uh, that's, that's one of the few times uh, when we got out of town real fast, and we did not stop at Whataburger. So, uh, so I, did Quero, who'd Quero have? You were in Gonzales. Or no, you were in, uh, you were in Quero. Yeah, okay. All right. <laughs> well, I'm glad that came up because now we know the rest of the story, as Paul Harvey would have said. Okay. Um, all right, here are a couple more for you. Inbounds and out of bounds. A pass is incomplete if one body part touches out of bounds at the same time, another body part touches in bounds. So what do we have? Simultaneous. He comes down straddling that sideline. Oh, please, can we get 100% on this one? All right, look at the responses pour in here. All right, let's see what we got. Indeed, it is true. Majority is correct. Um, okay, the only difference between a catch in the field of play and in the end zone is that there can be no catch uh, fumble situation. Is it a catch or a fumble in the end zone? We can't have the situation where we rule it a catch and then he fumbles it, is what they're saying. We cannot have that in the end zone, but we can have that in the field of play. Well, think about it, either team. What do you think? What happens once uh, the ball is in possession of team A in the end zone? Ball's dead, right? At that moment. So it stands to reason that you could not then have a fumble if indeed he possessed it when he crossed the goal line. Now team B, if he's in his own end zone, 
Uh, is the ball dead when he possesses it in his own end zone and he put it there? Mm, he's not. So he might be trying to get out and they, they nail him. All right, let's see what you all think. Okay. Um, again, that is true. True uh, would carry the day here. Uh, if you're in the minority on some of these responses, uh, take a look at um, this casebook. I think you'll find it uh, pretty interesting. Okay. Defensive pass interference can occur against an out-of-bounds player if he was earlier pushed out by a defender rather than going out on his own. Okay, he didn't go out on his own. The defender pushed him out. He hasn't had time to come back in or, you know, that thing isn't in play. He's out of, he was just pushed out of bounds. I'm, I'm assuming that what this means is it's not pass interference, that it involved something just before the ball was released. So he was pushed out of bounds, hasn't had a chance to either voluntarily uh, or not to come back in bounds, and he gets interfered with. What do you think? He does reestablish. Uh, I'll tell you that, but yeah. He, um, no, he hasn't reestablished. He's an out-of-bounds player. He is out-of-bounds. And the reason he's out-of-bounds was he was pushed out-of-bounds. He did not go on his own. Okay, let's see what you got. Whoa! Again, more consistency... Uh, uh, when we make this ruling from week to week. Uh, let's look at one more and we'll go back to this one and see what, uh, what the case book says. Okay, beyond the neutral zone, players from either team may legally interfere with a pass receiver after a pass has been touched. We know they can do that behind the neutral zone, but this is a case where it's beyond the neutral zone and the pass has been tipped. Uh, 